Hi, I'm Patrick Nugent with IICLE. I'm here with my great friend Bill Anaya today, who is a partner in the litigation group of Arnstern and Lair in Chicago, a dedicated um, lawyer to all of the lawyers in Illinois, a fantastic volunteer and teacher and author for us for many, many years. He also sits on our board of directors. Hi, Bill. How are you today? Hi, Patrick. Good to see you. Well, here's what we're talking about today. The Illinois Hydraulic Fracturing Regulatory Act and how it's going to affect lawyers. And you, my friend, are, uh, are one of the people that are going to be first and foremost to tell the lawyers in Illinois what they need to know and how the law is actually going to affect their practice. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bill and I. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick, very much. The Illinois Hydraulic Fracturing Regulatory Act, uh, it's commonly known as fracking, but at this particular point, let's talk about it. Uh, we'll assume that uh, the governor, uh, as, we, as we tape this, that the governor is going to sign it tomorrow. Today is June 11th, tomorrow is June 12th. The governor is expected to sign this bill into law, making the practice of hydraulic fracturing a regulated activity in Illinois. And I say it just that way because hydraulic fracturing has been around and been in practice in the state of Illinois since 1947. Uh, it, it, it's a misnomer for those to call it or criticize it or suggest that it's new technology. It's absolutely not new technology. It's, it's older than I am. It's older than my good friend Patrick, uh, by, by a good stretch. Uh, we've been involved in this process ever since we dug wells uh, in, in, like I say, the mid-40s. And the process is fairly simple. Uh, in, into a deep well that's in or adjacent to an area where there might be some energy, and we, we know that those energy locations might be shell deposits. Uh, uh, a, a boring is set down uh, uh, deep into this material, into this formation. Uh, material is uh, uh, with a perforated end at the at the annulus of that particular borehole with a casing uh, uh, hydraulic fluids water chemicals other kinds of activities sand uh, is jammed down in there at high uh, uh, frequency at high uh, 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 velocity and volume and it creates cracks or fissures in the shale deposits or other formations that are there, releasing the ancient methane gas and or oil that might be locked within the shale. Again, this technology has been around since 1947. And if you don't believe me, go to the oil and gas uh, DNR's website and, and, and check out the registry for oil and gas uh, uh, permits that have been issued. There's probably 20,000 wells in the state of Illinois as we sit here today that have been fractured. Uh, using this particular process. What's new, what's new is energy prices went sky high a couple of years ago. You may have noticed that at the gas pump last time you were there. Uh, you also uh, uh, may, may have noticed that gas, uh, natural gas prices a few years ago were fairly high. Uh, those prices were high, meaning that people were willing to put investment into this particular technology, and someone developed a better mousetrap. Someone developed horizontal fracturing, where we could actually uh, send a, a, a boring down several thousands of feet, turn it 90 degrees, and go horizontal for several thousands of feet, thereby unlocking a significant volume of energy, be it oil or be it gas. That technology is relatively new. I won't say it's brand new, but it's relatively new. But it is now affordable. It is now profitable. It is now, uh, there's now an incentive to do it. We know that the Bakken oil fields in the Dakotas, uh, we know that the uh, uh, Pennsylvania Marcellus shale has been producing uh, with this particular technology. And the hope, but the $64 million question, literally and figuratively, is whether we'll find that energy in the New Albany shale, which happens to be significantly deeper than the other two oil shale deposits, just for example. Um, there are millions of wells currently fractured in the United States. Uh, the routine use is between uh, eight to 12,000 gallons of water. Recently, however, the process has been refined in Illinois and up to 400,000 gallons of water were used at a well in the Illinois basin not too long ago. The expectation is a million gallons of water is going to be used in some of these practices. The, hence one of the concerns that we're having. They recover about half of that water uh, in, in, the, in the flow back, and the other half goes into pores and creeks and crevices and sand seams and whatnot that are below grade, uh, hence some of the concern that we're having. 
what do you do hydraulic fracturing for? We get coal uh, bed methane recovery. Methane or a little bug gas uh, created from uh, normal organic activity. We, you and I create methane gas. We won't go any further. But it, 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 the bugs did too when it was locked in between the shale and the idea of breaking up the shale and releasing that methane gas so that it goes up a pipe. Uh, oil and gas production, we do that, uh, fracturing, uh, disposal wells, gas storage, and a occasionally, interestingly enough, we use it for remedial activities at some sites. We actually fracture some of the uh, soil and groundwater so that we uh, can actually do some remedial activity at some of the more recalcitrant Superfund sites. Hydraulic fracturing concerns are, of course, the hydraulic fluid, the fracturing fluid that's used, that's, that's sent down this hole that's partly, only partly recovered. Some of it's proprietary, some of it has solvent, some of it has uh, material that some people suggest may be creating a problem. The other issues are uh, the water use itself that I alluded to a moment ago. Significant volume of water is used at a fracturing site. What are we going to do with that? Where are we going to get that water? How are we going to use it? What are we going to do with it when we're finished with it? How are we going to recover more than 50%? What are we going to do with the 50% that we recover? Uh, seismicity. Uh, do, uh, manufacture, do these uh, fracturing wells create the uh, uh, conditions that will make uh, seismic activity more uh, prevalent? Uh, there's some anecdotal references that it does. There's a lot of anecdotal references, a lot of scientific and empirical data that says that the fracturing process is akin to an apple falling out of a tree and landing on the ground. So you have a pretty wide spectrum of whether or not there's any seismic activity, but nonetheless it's something we have to talk about. and something that the Illinois General Assembly has tasked uh, one of the state agencies with looking at it. Obviously, we're concerned about water pollution. And the big question, the $64 million trillion dollar question, is is there any energy in the New Albany Shale? If there is, it's going to be a boom town. Uh, get a place in uh, Saline or Franklin County. Uh, say hi to my folks down there, the Hart brothers down there in Franklin County. Uh, 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 they'll get you a place uh, probably three times the price. God bless if that happens, because we'll have jobs, we'll have an economy that's roaring on, on that. It will be a boom and bust cycle like all oil and natural gas cycles have been. But we don't know. As we sit here today, we, 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 we don't know whether or not the New Albany Shale and the resources in southern Illinois will create this energy at these prices that will sustain itself. We hope that it does. The Illinois General Assembly hopes that it does. And the Illinois General Assembly isn't just saying go out there and do it like a bunch of cowboys. The Illinois General Assembly uh, uh, got together with people on all sides of the aisle, all sides of the issue, and created this particular law that we're going to be talking about. Illinois, we get things accomplished. In Illinois, somebody from business can sit down with a tree-hugging group and, 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 and fashion a particularly good statute. And this particularly good statute is the one we're going to be talking about today. Uh, the expected ale, shale oil deposits in Illinois stretch from Coles County and central Illinois southward with the highest concentrations of energy generation supposedly in Williamson, Franklin, and Saline counties in southern Illinois all the way down to probably Kentucky. Uh, the Illinois fracturing, uh, manufacturing, the Illinois Hydraulic Fracturing Regulatory Act, again, makes a practice that's been uh, implemented before now makes it a regulated activity. That's a remarkable instance. That's something that doesn't happen once or twice a lifetime when an activity that was heretofore legal becomes regulated, a regulated activity, and hence the, uh, the term of the statute. The Illinois Hydraulic Fracturing uh, Regulatory Act is an enabling statute. It allows the Illinois Department of Trans or Illinois Department of Natural Resources, I beg your pardon, Illinois Department of Natural Resources to implement regu regulations uh, that take into consideration some of the statutory criterion that we're going to tick off right now. There's a 300-foot setback, 300 setback requirement from uh, a water body. There's 500-foot setback requirement for a residence. There's 750-foot uh, setback from a nature preserve. So if you look at this, surface water body, residence, and nature preserves get the most setback. 1,500-foot setback from surface water that is used or uh, is an outlet or an inlet to uh, a public municipal drinking water system. 
Uh, those are the kinds of things. You can't place a well inside those setback activities. That's remarkable. That's new. That's regulated activity. That's something in Illinois that, we, that, that nobody else, Pennsylvania doesn't have, uh, and the Dakotas don't have. We require all of our operators to register. There's a registration process where the name and the address of the registrant and all of their corporate entities, uh, affiliates, are, are identified and disclosed. A disclosure is mandated of all prior activity that, that the, the uh, registrant has been involved in, and all violations in the last five years in any state. Those have to be resolved uh, by the Illinois Department of, of, of Natural Resources prior to allowing a registrant to uh, get involved in an application process. There has to be proof of at least $5 million in pollution liability cleanup insurance available. Just to be a registrant, those activities have to be. And then if, if we're going to be involved in the uh, hydraulic fracturing process, we have to prepare a permit application, and that permit application, we have to demonstrate those setback requirements that we talked about before. We have to describe the process, the well depth, the angles, the, the proprietary information, all of that that goes into it. No other state, no other jurisdiction has those kinds of uh, transparency, they're called in the popular press, requirements. Uh, we'll see how that's litigated. We'll see how that goes. Let's see, we'll see what's available through Freedom of Information Act. There's a lot of things that get undecided. But the fact of the matter is, is they're supposed to describe in the permit application subject to Freedom of Information Act review, the process and the angles and all the other activities that are involved in that, including the, the use of the hydraulic fluids. Uh, uh, a description of the fracking operation and the geologic formation that is going to be involved with the location of the borings, uh, the, the, the chemicals to be used, the water withdrawal and management levels of, uh, plan for supply and flow back uh, activities, plan for handling, storage, transportation, of disposal of the fracking fluids themselves, a site safety plan, a site contaminant plan, a well uh, closing and cementing plan, a traffic management plan, believe it or not, a traffic management plan, the names and addresses of all people within 1,500 feet of this particular activity, a draft public notice that will go on DNR's webpage and that will be sent to those people that are within 1,500 feet of the site, and of course the proof of the adequate insurance payable for uh, remedial activity that might be necessitated. The public notice and comment period, again, we're talking about industry and we're talking about environmental groups that got together to fashion the statute and this transparency concept. I, I'm, 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 I'm more inclined to work with uh, 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 folks who are doing this kind of activity, I'm less inclined kind of to work with uh, the environmentalists, but it is a very nice balance and it's, it looks like there's a good opportunity at the beginning. There's not any of this uh, stuff that you see in the movies, which I'm not sure I believe anyway, but in any event, uh, the public gets to know about these activities. The public notice is posted, uh, given to each, delivered to each uh, resident, and also posted on the w IDNR's uh, particular webpage. Uh, notice to in is provided to interested uh, state water, uh, state agencies, including the State Water Survey, the State Geological Survey, and of course, Illinois EPA. The general public gets direct mailings, and seven days after DNR receives an application, a 30-day public comment period begins. It just begins, public comments. Uh, you can have an opportunity, your clients can have an opportunity to write and discuss and describe and criticize or, and or uh, mandate certain activities or suggest certain activities, and those public comments must be answered. Uh, uh, you can submit any type of uh, activities or, or comments you want. In the event that someone requests a public hearing and DNR determines that it's not a frivolous request for a public hearing, there has to be a public hearing. You get an opportunity to, to have uh, uh, your concerns heard, your client gets an opportunity to have his day or her day. Uh, DNR can also deny or suspend permits for, or, or revoke permits after they've been issued. Uh, uh, for a thing they call good cause, such as permit violations, uh, provi uh, providing incomplete or misleading information in the application, or any other violations of the Illinois Gas, uh, Oil and Gas Act, or other violations in other states, or the Illinois Environmental Protection Act. Uh, 
there are certain other things that we, what we lawyers talk about what we're going to be involved in, the things that I hope to be significantly involved in is something I know a great deal about, and that's perfecting the administrative record. The administrative record to support the activities of my clients, or if I'm challenging the activities of, of, of someone else's clients who are doing these activities, the administrative record will be key. Supplementing that record appropriately, getting admissible evidence is the whole point of this. Uh, uh, one of the things that we do involved in this, there's opportunities to make uh, background conditions prior to the commencement of those activities. Baseline water samples must be collected in around the area. Regular sampling must continue during uh, the fracking activity. Uh, DNR can order additional water sampling and Illinois EPA may get involved to the extent that there might be or there will be a water complaint. Enforcement of the Illinois Hydraulic Frac Fracturing Act can be done criminally by the state's attorney, the local state, uh, and the local county, by the attorney general. It can be done uh, uh, in any type of activities of misdemeanor originally, but it can go as far as significant fines, penalties, and even to uh, uh, more serious penalties. Uh, civil enforcement is where a good deal of teeth are in this particular statute. Uh, civil enforcement is available by the state regulatory authorities, by the same state's attorney, but by private citizens acting as private attorneys general. We so much mean that we want this statute to be followed that we're allowing the 11 million people in the state of Illinois after a notice period is provided to act as a private attorney general to enforce the terms of a particular permit or uh, uh, the, the, the terms of this law if, it, if the allegation is that there's been a violation. The most significant, and I'm leaving it to the end of our discussion today, the most significant issue with regard uh, to this statute, the most significant provision in my world, and it, and it, and it puts the administrative record uh, on steroids, if you will, the hardest thing about frac uh, man, uh, hydraulic fracturing operations in the various states. The hardest thing about enforcement of state law in the Dakotas, in Pennsylvania, in Texas, other places, was, is making the uh, evidentiary connection between the hydraulic fracturing activities and an allegation of, or, or proof of a violation of Water Pollution uh, Act or, or a circle problem or a RICRA problem or whatever the term happens to be on that particular thing usually has to do with the uh, violations of safe drinking water and other types of activities like that. We just can't prove it. It's three miles down in the ground or a mile down in the ground. It goes left, it goes right. We have, nobody knows where the activities is. You don't know what sand seams are there. You don't know what kind of lithography is available. Proof is a significantly difficult burden for the regulatory agency. In this particular case in Illinois, we came up with a rebuttable presumption. It scares the daylights out of me, but on the same side, it also provides some solace to my friends that are involved in enforcement activities. I met somebody the other day in the train station that's involved in, in enforcement, and he said this was the thing that, that cinched it for the regulated people, is that they have this rebuttable presumption now. They, don't ha they have a prima facie case of a violation of a particular statute if there's a hydraulic fracturing activity and uh, the water sources and, and there's a violation of, 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 act, of the act and involves water so long as the water source is within 15 feet of the well site 1500 feet I'm sorry of the well site two if the water quality data previously collected shows no pollution uh, prior to the start of the high volume horizontal fracturing, and three, the pollution occurred during high volume horizontal fracturing uh, no more than 30 months after the completion of the high volume horizontal fracturing op operations. A presumption. It is high, it's a prima facie case that the violation occurred as a result of these particular activities that so those three conditions are made. To rebut the, con the, the uh, uh, rebuttable presumption, uh, the defendant, the, the respondent, whichever it is at that particular case, must show by clear and convincing evidence, not preponderance of the evidence. The government has a prima facie case or the a regulatory enforcement authority, whether that's a citizen or, 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 or a public entity, 
has preponderance of the evidence, presumably, under this particular rebuttable presumption. At least they get a prima facie case uh, of a violation if it's within those three conditions. But if we want to prove that it, to rebut the presumption, we've got to produce clear and convincing evidence, hence I call the, uh, the standard uh, admi the administrative record on steroids. And we have to show that the water source is not within 1,500 feet of the well site and the pollution occurred prior to the high volume horizontal fracturing operations or no more than 30 months after the completion of the high volume horizontal fracturing operations or three, the pollution occurred as a result of another identifiable cause. When we're putting together this administrative record, we have to think about all of the activities that are designed in the application and the registration and the background activities because we're always thinking about if we're on the side of the uh, uh, oil and gas operations defending that record. We're always considering whether or not we've put evidence in the administrative record that's admissible and will defend and rebut the presumption. Uh, there's a lot of work here in this particular statute. It's very exciting times, uh, but lawyers are in, inherently involved and uh, we're actually all kind of looking forward to it. Patrick? Well, I, that was fantastic uh, for a lot of different reasons. So, you know, first of all, we might not find that the shale is going to allow for this gas deposit to be uh, transformed. It's, which it's so much deeper than the other shale. That's a, that's a very good point, point. Right. And then secondly, it's interesting because, you know, I know with the, DA, with the, with the uh, Department of Natural Resources being involved, also looking at state budgets and how those budgets are for the, re you know, how are the, how are the regulating bodies going to actually have the type of budget to actually do some of this regulation? IDNR uh, is the agency who administers oil and gas. IDNR has been charged with the responsibility of writing these regulations. And, and, and promulgating these forms and doing the enforcement activities. They intend to hire lawyers, they intend to hire regulators, they intend to hire a lot of people because the expectation is uh, one of the things that we didn't cover that's in, in this particular 200, 123-page uh, statute. You know, that's, no, that is the statute. The statute right? uh, we hope the, government's, the governor signs tomorrow is a tax provision. They, they expect to get a uh, significant volume of money to be able to fund these activities. Right. Uh, well, they built right themselves now, Patrick, that safeguard as well, though, whereas the citizens do also have that ability to be able to say, um, in defense of themselves, uh, become their own body of, which is great in terms of, the, it, it gives that backup to the actual citizen that might uh, that's inevitably have polluted land or, right. The Illinois General Assembly is very serious about enforcing these particular standards. But to your earlier point, uh, there are no forms, there are no regulations, there are no rules. Right now, the administrative record couldn't be more difficult, more, more important, I should say, not difficult, but more important in the creation of. Uh, the application provides, the statute provides, that once the application has been filed, there's 60 days before DNR has to do any activities. Mm -hmm. And the expectation is they'll hire all these people, they'll write all these regulations, they'll publish all these forms in that 60 days. That's just not going to happen. Okay. That's unrealistic. And it's going to be a significant issue. It's going to be a little bit cumbersome at first. Right. Well, listen, I want to thank you for coming in and, and doing this for us because uh, we really always like to be in the forefront of uh, information for lawyers in the state of Illinois. This is stuff that's coming down the pike probably as of tomorrow or the next day, certainly within the next few weeks. Um, and um, I want to thank you for coming in and, and uh, allowing ICL to be, uh, you know, a guidance for lawyers out there in terms of how these laws are going to come to be how they're going to actually affect you, your practice, and how they're going to affect real estate in general in the state of Illinois and uh, the environmental law in the state of Illinois to boot. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Bill.